Okay, so welcome everyone to 2022, um, the beginning of System Thinking Ontario. Um, and um, so we're going to uh, start off the year with a little more of the uh, reading style that we originally had in System Thinking Ontario. And uh, when we start off System Thinking Ontario, we actually met in person in a circle. And what we would do is actually um, read articles. So not everyone read the articles, but a few people would get an idea. Uh, we'd have a summary of what some of the content was, and then we'd kind of work our way through um, having discussions about how people are doing um, with the ideas and questions they have and comments. So today's topic, topic was living, becoming, process, philosophy, system thinking, and time. Um, and we'll first go around and we'll have introductions uh, with everyone. Um, and if you guys could mute and unmute at appropriate times. And, um, and uh, the question for the day should be, uh, one, um, how'd you come to system thinking if you're new to the group? And two, have you ever heard of process philosophy or are you still trying to figure stuff out? So um, going back out of screen share. And so we'll have a few people introduce themselves. Um, I'll go around according to who I see on the screen. Uh, Kelly, say hi. Hi, I'm Kelly. I come regularly. <laughs> Thanks. Tim? Hi, Tim here. Uh, uh, been attending on and off for quite a while. And um, the other question was about process philosophy. Yes, I've heard of it, yeah. And uh, kind of fond of it over the past uh, number of years. And I came to it through pragmatism uh, and which took me sort of starting from James and the gang, uh, eventually found Whitehead. And that's really where I would say I discovered it through Whitehead. I've actually taken a look at Whitehead and it scares me to death. So <laughs> <laughs> I've decided to avoid that as much as possible. I'm kind of going the soft way. Uh, thanks, Tim. Dean. Hi, my name's Dean. Uh, I've been coming to these for the last uh, year or so to uh, every, every, some of them at least, and uh, background in physics, work on environmental issues. And uh, no, not familiar with process philosophy as, read, as defined in the papers anyway. Thanks, Dean. Don. Oh, hi. Yeah, this, this is a topic that's interested in me for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> from back when I like to think my thinking was more juvenile, but uh, uh, I actually discovered it through Whitehead also. I got this book back in the early 60s, <laughs> Process and Reality. Um, and when I was fascinated by it, I was fascinated by everything he wrote, the all well, that I could read and understand. And um, I also uh, began to appreciate, as I studied other thinkers, um, that um, teleology has a lot to do with uh, with systems thinking, whether they it's admitted or not. It's not just where you came from, but where you're going. And um, now that's certainly an aspect of consciousness and biology, but is it an aspect of reality as a whole? But then again, what is reality as a whole, except as we understand it? <laughs> so it becomes quite a circular business. Um, you know, I, I found traces of it in uh, uh, what's it, Robert Lanz's work, you know, beyond biocentrism and beyond biocentrism. And also, of course, in uh, uh, Maturana and uh, uh, Varela's work, too. But at a bit of a, a bit of a remove, they're being kept more cautious, I think. But uh, yeah, it's, it's important. Uh, and uh, I don't think we've come to any kind of conclusion that I have heard of, but I'm willing to learn. <laughs> Thanks, Don. You may help us fill us in in Whitehead if you can. Oh, no, uh, I can't. No, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Kevin, say hi. Hi, new to the group. I uh, have half a shelf of Whitehead and scared death of it. I came to process philosophy through Henri Bergson. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Tom. 
Hi, I'm Tom. First time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bruce? Hi, um, this is my second um, meeting that I've attended. And um, my background is in engineering and um, program management. I'm a member of the INCOSI and the IFSS. Um, I saw the words uh, living and then becoming and then process. And that connected me to the study I've been doing of Fritjof Capra's book, The Systems View of Life. And I've taken his course and that got me into Maturana and Damasio and a whole bunch of other people. But it, it's um, the word philosophy I have trouble with, but, <laughs> and I, you know, if there's a, uh, pro oh, the word process, um, one of the reasons I took the course was to understand how Fritjof used the word process. He uses many words, very differently than I expected. But uh, one of the things I did over the time I was studying it is I helped him produce a glossary. So I now understand his language in his words, which makes it much easier to understand the books he writes. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Thanks, Bruce. Oh, I'm also in uh, Oxford. So if I can't stay up any later, <laughs> I may disappear. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. Uh, Petri. Hey, I'm Petri, uh, systems designer. My interest in process philosophy goes back to Heraclitus and the dynamic nature of being, our place within it. Um, actually, I just read an article and made that up. But yes, <laughs> something I'm very interested in. Uh, and I'm definitely going to dig into this. Hello. Thanks. Uh, is it Yerma or Germa? Hi, uh, it's actually Joanne. I don't know how Yerma ended up there. So I, I'm Joanne. Um, I, uh, I'm coming from a completely different world of uh, design and apparel for the last 20 years. And I'm actually a student at OCAD uh, part-time along with my work uh, in strategic foresight and innovation. And I came to you via um, Dr. Peter Jones and Jeremy Bowes, who are professors of a systems design and systemic design course. So uh, they recommended to connect with you guys. So I'm hoping you will all be my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I haven't. I lectured two years ago. Um, so those lectures are actually on uh, YouTube. Um, so you can find them. But the, the discussion we're having today is not stuff that we really discussed back then. We've actually been making progress on system changes. So, um, so we're going to be using some of that. So welcome. Exciting. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Liam, say hi. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Liam. I'm actually a classmate of Joanne, who I uh, just spoke. And I come from design. I've run my own design firm for nearly a decade and uh, teaching at Carleton University here in Ottawa in communications. And um, so in addition to what we're exploring uh, in our program, um, I've often, just as, a, just as my way of being, I'm not really process oriented. Um, I am, but it, it's, it's just it's maybe a bit different. And I, I tend to focus more on the results than the process. And um, I think this is going to be a really interesting opportunity to, to learn and to listen. And um, I mean, that we're already quoting mathematicians uh, and philosophers uh, has already got me pretty excited. So I'll just, I'll stop there. Thanks, Liam. Nelia. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I'm actually a former student of David's. I did the SFI program and, um, and now I'm working. I have left uh, OCAD. Um, uh, I used to be a lawyer um, and now I'm working in strategic foresight. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I get 
uh, David's emails and the, the topic just seems so interesting. And uh, so I wanted to uh, jump on. Um, I have to leave uh, at around seven. I have an, uh, something to attend to, but I'll try and come back. Um, so I just don't, don't want to be rude. Thank you so much for having uh, this. Very okay. Thanks. Good to see you. Larissa, say hi. Hi there. Um, I'm also an SFI student um, coming from the full-time program. Um, so systems thinking is relatively new to me. Thanks. Griff. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, Griffin here. I've been uh, with Systems Thinking Ontario a number of times over the past couple of years. Uh, and I love the idea of process, uh, background like project management and a bunch of other things that sometimes seem to forego the idea. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Joshua. Hi, and I've been coming out to these events uh, off and on for past couple of years and uh, found out about it through um, your uh, notices uh, with uh, Center for Social Innovation. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I'm not um, conversant with uh, uh, process philosophy, but um, did uh, uh, make an attempt at uh, readings for this evening. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Great. Thanks. Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael. Um, it's my first time to uh, join this, uh, this meeting. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I registered by the Eventbrite. So I, uh, yeah, nice to meet the old person. Uh, thanks. Good. Thanks. Okay. So um, I've dropped in the chat um, the, uh, there's the link to the slides if people want to follow along. There aren't that many of them. Um, and if people have questions or discussions, uh, if you can queue them up, um, let me, uh, let me send, okay, let me resend that again. I'll resend the link uh to everyone there we go um so if people want to send messages and and uh then we can uh kind of queue up things as we go along um so the background for this uh let me start this here uh slideshow start from here and then find the page again where'd it go so, uh no, let's do it this way. Share screen and share the screen. Um, the background for this topic uh, is um, there's a, a group of us and Dan and Kelly are online and uh, I saw Robert at a certain point and we'll see him around now, um, who have been running a uh, the system changes learning circle for, uh, for a little while. And part of that has been um, looking at systems thinking and how we should be thinking about system thinking in the 21st century because we're kind of rooted in the 1980s and uh, how we might approach it differently and one of the things we backed into is actually process philosophy and so the the issue uh, that we get into is we, when we think about systems thinking traditionally a lot of the metaphors that we have are actually about machines and uh, structures and things that uh, are more durable or don't seem to change in time. Um, but most of the time, we should be interested in living systems. And so we kind of get into this uh, conundrum about, well, you know, how should we approach things differently? Um, so especially for the people who have come, the students who uh, haven't heard the lectures before, I'm going to cover some systems thinking basics first. Um, and that's just definitional. So we kind of have the same uh, language or something to, to start off on. Um, then I'm going to run briefly over some of the main ideas from the three articles from David Hawke's article, uh, 1999. Uh, we actually had a conversation with him um, last week, and uh, I actually met him at the conference where he actually gave this paper the first time. Uh, it was Russell Acoff conference. Um, then we'll go a little bit through uh, Ingold's work on temporality of the landscape um, that extends from there. Um, the, the last one is actually the most complete paper, but one I'm going to cover the least. Um, and that one uh, by uh, Nayak and Chia, it's actually in the domain of organization science. 
And so there are people in the management research area who are interested in looking at process philosophy and how it changes the way that people um, uh, might organize or think about their work differently. And so the reason I included it is that um, the problem as uh, Don and others have spoken up and said Whitehead is like ridiculously difficult to read. Um, I, I took a crack at it and I'm going, oh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, um, and so trying to be more practical, the question is, well, what, what do you really do with that? And the Nyack and Chia is good for that. And then we'll open up for discussion and uh, see what people think. And is this useful, not useful, how you might use it or how it might change the way you think, see things. So some of the basics on systems. A system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts. Um, and so the whole is the idea. Every part of the system has property it loses when it's separated from the system. And every system has some properties, the essential ones that none of the parts do. Uh, the usual one that we talk about in a whole is, um, again, I have to think of a better one because the classical one they talk about is water. Water is a whole, and if you study hydrogen, oxygen, the property of wetness is in neither one of them. Um, and so you can think about uh, other types of systems with holes. And so um, I'll just make one up now. So think about a family as a whole. The family has parents, it has children, um, but the whole is different from the parents and the children when you add them all together. So anyone that's ever had to do a road trip and get the whole family in a car and drive somewhere, it's different from having <laughs> not everybody in the car all at the same time, the result is different. So when we think about systems thinking, we should look at it, not just at the system itself, but uh, what typically happens is on the left, a system can contain subsystem or components. And so people look at a system and they go, oh, what's inside the system? But what people should also do is look at a system from what it's contained by. So you have a system of interest, and you could say, well, it's contained by one super system or by another super system. And so if we take the um, usual favorite I have is uh, transit in Toronto when you're riding a streetcar, uh, there's a super system, which is um, the city and the city owns it. Uh, you could also have a super system of labor, uh, la la um, the unions and how that goes, the super system of finance, how things get paid and all the, the system participates in all those type of systems. The definition that I've published is system thinking as a perspective of parts, holes, and their relations. Um, and this is kind of the minimal set of, uh, of um, definitions that we have looking at systems. And so firstly, when we talk about function, function, function is contribution of the part to the whole. When we talk about a function, we usually use that for a non-living uh, system. When we talk about living systems with people, we usually say it's a role as opposed to being a function. But the, the function part whole relation is one that people um, use quite often. Um, structure is an arrangement of space. Um, and so usually we have part, part relations. Process is an arrangement in time. Now this is a tricky part. And so the question that we ask, the philosophical question we ask is which comes first structure or process? Um, in systems theory, there is a second law of thermodynamics, uh, which says that time is a one-way arrow, and so you can't go backwards in time. Um, mm -hmm. So technically, process precedes structure, because structure is the slowest changing process ever. When we look at a mountain, a mountain is actually a process, but we see it as a structure because it changes so slowly we don't observe that change as human beings. However, uh, unless you're in a landslide, uh, there, there is process in structure. Um, behavior is the last one, which is uh, a system change which initiates over other events. Uh, so the behavior is you could have a reaction or response, or you might have an autonomous action associated with it. So those are the four definitions around systems. Um, and the, the problem we have when people talk about systems is if we have this idea that process is an arrangement in time and process in, in time comes before space, then how is that changing the way that we think about the system? Stuart Brand has this um, model in the uh, original book called How Buildings Learn. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I recommend the, um, the BBC series you can find on YouTube. 
And he uses the metaphor, uh, what do you actually really want to study originally with organizational learning? Uh, but he uses the metaphor of a house. And so you have the site, which is at the uh, base of the building. Um, that is the slowest changing layer. If you have to change the site, it's pretty major. From the site, you have the structure, which are the load bearing walls that you put on top of it. And that goes up before anything else goes up. Uh, you put the skin on the outside, which protects the structure. Uh, then you put in the services on the inside. The services are all of the uh, electrical services. Ow. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, the services are um, electrical wiring, plumbing, HVAC, all those sorts of things. Um, and uh, it fits inside of the skin and structure. Um, someone's getting feedback. OK, sorry. Um, so uh, inside the services, you have the space plan, the non load bearing walls. Um, and inside of that, you've got the stuff, which is all the furniture you move around. And so while this is actually a structural view of a, a building, it is actually a process oriented view of, of the building because you have in the slower changing layers, you have the constraints. Um, and in the, uh, in the faster changing layers, you have the ability to do stuff faster. So if we take as example, the space plan with non load bearing walls, um, the space plan with the non load bearing walls, uh, you could have a closet or you can have an armoire. A closet is actually part of the space plan. It's permanent. Um, the stuff that is inside, you can, uh, uh, if you have an armoire or chest of drawers, you can move that around. Um, when you're actually working through pacing layers, uh, and this is where some of the stuff in systems thinking um, in time comes, when you're going to make a change to the system, are you making a change within the layer, within the same pacing layer? So your um, space plan could be, okay, you're going to move, move some non-load bearing walls. That's not a problem until you come to a load bearing wall or a services. So if you hit uh, plumbing, it's like, well, you have to work around that. Um, so um, there are constraints in the speeds of change. Jesus Ow. Jeez. Sorry. Whoever that is, can you please, please mute? I'm very sound sensitive. I'd appreciate that, I please. Appreciate that. Uh, Don, yeah. Could you, please, could you please mute? I'm checking who else is not muted. I think uh, Don is muted now. Okay. okay, everyone looks like they're muted. Or Don, are you are you logged in twice? Uh, it's possible, I suppose. I see. I see you on twice. I'm not sure why. Uh, one with a camera and one without. I see. Okay. Um, well, I don't know how to get rid of the other one. <laughs> hmm. If there's two. Okay. Sorry. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I can uh, put you on hold. And I'm going to come back to this one and mute you. Okay, so I'll mute. So I'll have to come back and unmute you, Don, if we have a question. Um, okay, so, um, so if we go to general systems theory, now general systems theory was um, trying to explain different types of systems, and this goes back to an article um, by uh, Kenneth Boulding on. Um, general systems theory as a skeleton of science. Uh, and so he has nine categories of systems. The non-living systems are frameworks, clockworks, and thermostats. Um, and the living systems are uh, open systems, plants, animals, human beings, social organization, and transcendental systems. And so when we talk about living systems, you can't turn off a living system and expect it to continue. Um, you just, uh, I always remember watching the Star Trek episode where uh, Data has an off button. And he says, you don't want people to know you have an off button. Uh, but he was a machine, so you could turn them off and turn them back on, um, maybe without damage, maybe with damage. 
Um, but living systems have this behavior that if you actually shut them off in some way, they're gonna, it's gonna be a problem associated with them. Now, definitional, um, equilibrium. An equilibrium, the only system with an equilibrium is one that is dead. And so the ideas of equilibrium are not what you're really dealing with when you're dealing with life. If I go back to one slide, um, so you can see that in the frameworks and clockworks and thermostats, you kind of get to equilibrium. So uh, the, um, the clockworks have our machines have a tendency to equilibrium and thermostats are, um, are cybernetic mechanisms and they have equilibrium with information that provides it. Um, but all the other ones, uh, uh, all the other forms of living systems, and that, that would be a different topic in itself, a quite difficult one. Um, you're trying to explain life and you end up with um, entropy as things go from order to disorder and how you explain um, life. Um, so that is a big topic. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment and just come out of that and um, stop the screen share so I can check, see what's happening in the chat here. Okay. Um, Dean asks, are you presenting the materials relevant to the Hawk article? Um, yes, um, I am because I'm gonna get to that right now. <laughs> so let me go into that. Um, oh, share screen. And slideshow from here. Okay. So um, now David Hawk, um, when I first met him, um, was looking at systems thinking and looking from this perspective. And in, a, in essence, we're, found, we're, we're down to two ways of looking at nature and how human beings negotiate with themselves in the world. And we say negotiate, um, that's like negotiating a curve. And so how is it you actually deal with the world? And so there's two ideas. One is reality is a changelessness state. Um, Parmenides and Confucius, the idea is that you have this uh, idea where th the, what is real is that which, that which does not change. And so uh, we have the platonic solids here, which are ideals, and you have the idea of a shift uh, towards uh, stability, and you may look for sustainability in that shift. But in essence, it's an analytic paradigm where you're taking things apart and you're trying to find um, atoms are trying to get down to elements. The alternative is reality is a state of change, not a change of state. Um, this is why Heraclitus, also in Chinese philosophy, Lao Tzu does um, the same sort of approach. There's beauty in the dynamic. Uh, and so what you're looking for is you're actually looking for change um, as opposed to trying to protect the static. Um, and there's contextual appreciation there. So context, when, when you talk about um, reality in the ideal state that you would get from, um, from Parmenides, um, in effect, you've got a perfect, a perfect cube, uh, you know, uh, a perfect uh, whatever sort of ideal, and it doesn't change in the world. Um, if you look at it, reality is a state of change instead, then the contextual appreciation says, well, does that make a difference? Does the world outside make a difference? And so when we're doing systems thinking, um, systems have this idea that uh, there is an environment uh, when you're talking about open systems and open system exchanges with the environment. And so you'd ask, well, what is the environment and how's the environment change? And so um, that's what we mean by contextual appreciation. Uh, we've been doing a lot more research into what context means. And uh, if you're looking at the word context, one of the confusing things is that um, we actually trace back to the idea, not of text as in words, but in texture as in a weave. And so contextual, uh, I actually use sometimes contextural uh, because what you're doing is you're taking a texture, a weave that is in time. And then how do you fit into that? Um, going to, to Tim Ingold's perspective on temporality of the landscape, um, you can actually look at dwelling, um, and there's actually a famous article by um, 
by Heidegger, where he talks about dwelling and when you're doing being and time. Uh, when you actually read it, my read of it closely is that it actually uh, most people think about dwelling as being like you're living in a space. But, but my read of Heidegger closely, it doesn't actually say that it has to be in space. You can dwell in time. And so if we have this idea of the landscape um, and we have a, a river flowing, uh, we think of the river as a thing, but the river changes. And so when you're living in a landscape, that's something that you're inhabiting and you're journeying along a path. If you, idea, if you put in the idea of temporality, um, Tim Ingold has this idea of what he calls a task scape, because if you come, he comes out from an anthropological standpoint, and the temporality says that you're living in, not just in space, but you're living in time, and the tasks you have, you are moving in the world. Um, and so in temporalizing the landscape, one of the interesting things he says is that when we look around us, maybe we should be looking, thinking not about what we see, but actually what we hear. Uh, because when you're moving, um, you have this, you, you, you can't hear at a snapshot in time. It's something that is changing over time. Uh, a lot of the work that Ingold talks about is about moving and walking and these sorts of things and paying attention. And so the shift from um, intention towards attention is one of the things that happens when you start looking at um, temporality. Trying to be a little more concrete with the, the work that was done by uh, Nayak and Chia, um, you can kind of compare being versus becoming. Uh, being is uh, very much oriented towards end states. We're having, uh, there's a mention before about teleology and a lot of the, lot of the world is at systems. They, they often describe the system in terms of goals or ideals or objectives or these sorts of things. Um, if you look at a process view, if you look at plants, you have to ask, well, does a plant really have a goal? A plant is a living thing. Um, and so should we actually be say, seeing these things in terms of goals? And goals might be something or ends might be something that we actually reflect on uh, going backwards. And we said, oh, that was a person's goal. Um, this is one of the things actually working a lot with David Hawk over the years. Uh, with, in explaining how I ended up in Finland at a university there it was, I could explain that, you know, the reason I went was that I, uh, I was going back to meet Mina, who had been one of David's students, uh, but I could, the other answer would be, I felt like going. Uh, I didn't need a goal. I just went because I went. And so one of the things about systems thinking that you should watch out for when you're looking at it is, are you expressing the system in terms of goals? And should you be doing that? Um, for those who have, have been with me a long time, who've been in some of the lectures, um, I used to say that I would spend half of the time describing Russ Acoff and On Purposeful Systems, and because Russ Acoff is very, very clear in his teaching, but he's very focused on teleology. So I'd spend the first half of the class, everyone's getting up on Acoff, they all learn the language, and they learn about ends and objectives and ideals and all those sorts of things. And then I would spend the second half of the lecture telling you why Acoff is wrong. Because just because a goal is something you ascribe to, a, uh, to observing a system doesn't actually mean that's what happened in the system. Um, and so that's one of the challenges we have. We start, they would change from being to becoming. Um, in organization science, when we look at being, you end up with these micro practices, everyday, practical everyday coping is something that is described uh, a lot. Uh, Heidegger uh, does that, uh, Spinoza, Flores, and Dreyfus do that, uh, following that. And uh, sense making is something that is done. Um, Carl Weick does a lot of that. The alternative would be look at organizational life, um, contingency, emergency, um, things that emerge actually, creativity, uh, complexity. Um, and so these things are not things you observe from the outside. It's something you experience and you go through with time. When you're looking at being, we often think about an individual person in an environment. If you're thinking about a system, and I described a system before as a family. Uh, so you have the family and you say, okay, we have the child, we have the parents. But if you're looking from a becoming perspective, what you should be looking at perhaps is a nexus of historically shaped relationships. 
Um, so I was self telling some people that I just came back from visiting my son who uh, just got married in November. Um, and so, you know, yes, he's still my son, which would be the being a- approach, but it's kind of like, well, he's now married. So he's someone else's husband now. And that really changes the relationships of everything, um, relationship with my son as well. Um, being, there's a focus on substances, uh, material things, and often the discussions about social entities locatable in a finite period of a finite region of space, finite duration of time. And so when you're saying being, you're actually trying to isolate and say, this is a thing. Uh, when you're talking about becoming, this idea of process, flux, and transformation is a stuff in reality. And the idea that something is actually um, staying still, you have to ask, well, is that thing dead or is it doing anything? Um, in being, there's this idea in organizational change that's pretty common, which is the unfreeze, change, refreeze. And it's been attributed to uh, Kurt Lewin, or Levine, as actually pronounced. Um, and, or, and, but if you actually look at the articles, um, Levine never actually wrote anything about unfreeze, change, refreeze. That was people afterwards that were looking at it. Um, and this is a focus on structure rather than process. Uh, if you look instead at the becoming, where stability, order, and organizational or exceptional states, then it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, when they didn't reorganize or when they didn't change, that was something that was unusual. Uh, being often focused on formal knowledge and linguistic representation. So, um, you know, is, is stuff written down? Is it actually available? Can you pin it down to something? Uh, becoming is tacit knowledge on the creative flow of reality. Um, and it changes over time. So what I know today is not what I know yesterday or 10 years ago. Uh, being, there's often a big focus on identity. Um, and when you're creating that, you're trying to exclude the contradictions. Uh, with becoming, actually what you're looking at is the differences over time, differences um, uh, as you're working through them, and the result of multiple uh, opposite tensions. Uh, one of the definitions I didn't cover in systems thinking is ACOF definition of synthesis, uh, which is putting things together, and analysis, which is taking things apart. Uh, and ACOF says that one of the, uh, the, the key ideas is that in systems thinking is that synthesis precedes analysis. You're actually looking for putting things together as opposed to taking things apart. If that's the case, then we actually should be looking at becoming before we look at being. Um, we're gonna go into the discussion. I'm just gonna briefly talk about how this gets even more complicated uh, in the work that we're doing in System Changes Learning Circle, uh, because what we're doing now is actually moving away from the dualistic modern Western formal logic towards a contextual dyadic, which is a classical Chinese in, in implicit logic. So, in Western, we're looking at abstract and permanent. This is tr the tradition you see when, you, when you're looking at uh, reality as things that don't change. Um, but in the contextual, uh, in the Chinese philosophy, we, with context makes a difference. Um, the pairings that they have, now if you actually go to dualistic models, so what you have in Western philosophy is superior, inferior, subordinate, subordinate, intrinsic value, non-intrinsic, human and non-human, but the pairings that they have in Chinese philosophy are that the term presupposes opposite. So a cat implies not cat, not, not the whole universe. And there's a context dependence. So when you're talking about, um, and there's a big criticism. Um, so this is from uh, Keacock Lee's work on the philosophical foundations of classical Chinese medicine. Um, the context dependence, when you, when you get into the opposition of superior and inferior, they're not really equal. It's one is more than the other. Whereas in Chinese philosophy, we have the context where um, they, you have that context. It's, it's not a superiority. It's, uh, it is a uh, dyadic relationship. Um, so the frames that we have within the dual, within the dualistic models tend to be hierarchical reductionist and oriented towards entity thing ontology. Uh, the Chinese philosophy, when it actually started unraveling it, um, is actually much, the yin and yang, people think about that as yin and yang in structure. But the interesting problem is when you start thinking about yin and yang over time. Um, and that's why it's been interesting looking at traditional Chinese medicine um, and, and trying to figure out how that works uh, with rhythms. Um, so that's the uh, slides. I'm going to stop.
and uh, welcome discussions. And I'm looking at uh, chat here. Uh, Bruce, do you want to have um, some comments about Checkland and Shine? Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much. What a great presentation because uh, I'm a big follower of ACOF, uh, given my, I was a, made aware of that in the System Thinking Network on LinkedIn. And uh, that is what I tried to blend with Capra's work. And one of the things I find in looking at your presentation is that I relate to everything, except I can put lots of different labels on it. And um, I find it really fascinating. So the conclusion that I've come to, and I've been practicing with trying to uh, work with many different types of systems in a kind of GST way with, you know, Bertalan fee and all of that. And, um, I've come to the conclusion that there are three basic things. One is system properties that either are emergent or part of the uh, uh, system. And then there's the structure and the behavior. And they line up very nicely with what you have. It's the structure in Fritschhoff's language is called a pattern of organization. And in systems engineering, that's called the logical design. It's invariant over time in general. So you can have a structure, and this is how I look at buildings now, that you can have a structure and then you can have a realized structure or an instance of a structure as a, as a dynamic representation of that. So you get the processes visible and you get the changes. And in Fritschhoff's language, it's called structural change. And I hear that a lot. I also hear pattern of organization a lot in people's language. Um, and I now relate them to structure and behavior and it makes a lot more sense. But what I find is that the whole, people don't tend to put the defined properties as ACUF would call them in a separate category. So they're the emergent or defined properties. So I'm now working with those three which map very nicely into what you have. Um, but it's just wonderful to see it in the way you describe it, because I can relate to all of it. It's wonderful. Since, since you're talking systems engineering, uh, systems engineering is actually pretty big on maintenance <laughs> and uh, maintaining a system, which would be the process that they have over time. Uh, in how buildings learn, uh, Stuart Brand- oh, wait, wait, wait a second. What was that? That's not my understanding. No, you can so say that you, again. Well, so if you actually look at the life cycle of whatever you're engineering, you'd have to include maintenance, right? Yeah. And, and, and so in uh, How Buildings Learn, uh, Stuart Brand actually had written uh, when you published that was, uh, uh, you know, spend more, spend less on, um, on decorating whatever it is what you're building and spend more time on the, uh, on the structure and then allocate a lot of money in the future for maintenance. Um, and uh, Stuart Brand is actually working on a book. He's actually released the first chapter as audio, which I haven't heard, um, but um, the, his new book is on maintenance. Yeah, so he's let, let, me just, let me just comment that a lot of the words are really important. When you say structure, are you referring to building structure? Uh, I'm using system structure. So arrangement and well, space as opposed to arrangement and time. Yeah, so that, totally agree. But arrangement in space or relationships and proper uh, the parts and relationships, that I do agree is structure. But uh, the way Fritschhoff, and I keep going back to Fritschhoff, the way he saw that through autopoiesis was a lot of the structure is kind of brought to life so if you know the structure, you can bring it to life through the tr uh, triggers that cause the processes to be effect affected, which is quite interesting. So you can, so I don't, so I see structure. We've just had our, our um, house extended and you can see the structure and all of that, which is basically 
the physical structure and a lot of the other things we don't consider part of the house. We consider that a different system. Living space, we consider a different system. And how we position the stuff in there is based upon what we use the room for, not the overall house. So it's a nested set of systems, even when you look at a house. Mm -hmm. And depending upon who, what system of interest you have, you have a different set of stakeholders for that. Mm -hmm. So it's all very interesting, but it, from uh, the words you use are system of interest. And what I've found is that many times we don't talk about the same system of interest. Right. We're all over the place. Right. But and if we talk, lot, so I need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So using the, the, the same language, and then we yeah. can have a conversation. So the, the question is, if we identify the system of interest, are we actually looking in time? Well, to me, a system of interest has structure, behavior, and properties. So you have to look at all three dimensions. But does it, does it have process? I said, yeah, yeah. The process is behavior. I put process on the behavior side. Uh, behavior is actually a, a um, behavior is a response uh, at the level of a whole. Um, and so we have internal processes. So my heart beating is an internal process, but it's not a behavior per se, because it's not responding to the outside world. Yeah, and that's where I might call that a function or a capability of a system at a property level, okay. at a whole level. So I separate the whole, this is their defined properties okay. from ACOF. Uh, no, uh, actually these, these citations are from ACOF. <laughs> so, so the the, okay. the process definition is from ACA. Okay, I'm gonna have to go find that one. But I think yeah, um, it, it, it's in the slide, so it's actually there. It, okay. it, 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 I'm it, taking it, up too much time. I really okay. appreciate what you've done. I think okay. I need to get on the same page with you. But okay, very very good. Thank you. Okay, Dean. <laughs> Thanks, David. I'll, I unfortunately. Uh, I thought uh, there, I'll be able to get to go a bit quicker. I have to leave short. I have another commitment. So I'm going to end up throwing stones and then bailing. I apologize in advance. So I thought the Hawk paper was terrible. For, and I, I you know you picked it and you sound like you're a fan of him. So a uh, fan of his. So uh, I'll uh, you know, apologize for that in advance. Um, one of the papers wasn't available for me online, but I also read the NAAC and Shia paper. Mm -hmm. um, on the Hawk paper, uh, you know, one of the things that bugged me about it was that, uh, I mean, I think he was trying really, in some of this conversation, even the, the conversation you just had with Bruce, that's every time you try to discuss philosophy papers, everyone's using words differently, and a lot of it doesn't make a lot of sense to normal people. Um, you know, he, for in the Hawk paper, uh, this you know supposed commitment of society to changelessness, and how the, the the right way is to see things in terms of change. I mean, I, I think he's creating a bit of a straw man for how society thinks about these things. Uh, he he comes back to a couple of environmental examples, which something I know something about, and I thought they were terrible. He, he, you know, and he talks about his problem one on page 60, 63 and sixty four. I think he's saying that international environmental governance is really misguided because it's committed to a version of sustainability that is something about entropy and recycling. And he's making this commitment that everyone only cares about recycling and they don't understand entropy. So I, anyway, I thought his paper didn't, didn't make a lot of sense. He didn't explain what he's trying to put across. And also, uh, uh, his, you know, he, he praises Garrett Hardin in there at one point. Um, you know, if people want to read a bit more about Garrett Hardin, there's a really excellent article that was published in Scientific American a few years ago, 2019, I think, called uh, The Tragedy of the Tragedy of the Commons. And, talked, and I actually, it kind of shocked me when I first read it. I went back and reread, uh, uh, actually read for the first time the original six page article that he published on tragedy of the commons and it, it was as bad as the scientific american article article presents so uh, his praising garrett harden didn't do me any favors for liking him either um so there's that and i don't really have a lot of time to discuss we could have made notes and we don't need to get into it but i don't think he did a very good job of explaining what it is he's trying to present and he, he fell victim to the same thing i saw in the chia and nyack paper which is i think they are trying to present a very rigid vision of society 
believes this changelessness version and actually we all need to think about change. Well, I don't know if that's really groundbreaking stuff. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's hard to interpret what their examples are, uh, but by, you know, if you think about it, you know, in human life, right? what is a, are they, are they making the argument that a human, some people are claiming that is a, a permanent thing and we should think of a human as change. Well, sure, a human is a collection of wave functions that at any given time, it's useful to describe it as a systems thinker or as a Patriots fan. But at another time, those it's in a constant process of evolving and becoming something different. Is it useful to temporarily describe something as a changeless actual entity? Sure. Is it useful to also look at how it's involved in processes of change? Sure. So I think they're drawing a lot of that false dichotomies in both of these papers. I, I wasn't really overly impressed, to be honest. It's a difficult subject, and it's a big leap. And so um, part of the reason for bringing this up was that I discovered that most of the Chinese philosophy I've been reading is all process-based. And so it's, it's going to be a challenge. And the team that has been working on this, um, they've taken it on, and it's coming up the curve. Um, for, as for David Hawk himself, um, he's republished his dissertation um, and, uh, and it's come out as books. And so um, I don't know if you caught, there was a recording of System Thinking Ontario from a year ago when he actually uh, went over some of the stuff. So if you didn't, were you on that, on that call or? I don't remember. Okay. At then, the time, it wouldn't have struck me as much as actually taking the time to read a 20 page paper and say, oh, this is not good. Yeah, because, uh, because mu much of what he described there and, and it's, it's always better to hear it when he's talking about it himself. Uh, he actually spoke about it then. So I think if you had actually been on that call, you might have objected then as well. So, <laughs> okay. Sorry to throw stones and dash. And I wish I, I wanted to have a chance to talk about if any people agreed or disagreed with me, but I have another thing that started one minute ago. I, I thought okay. I'll be back at future meetings. Bye. Okay, thanks. Uh, Liam. Is Liam still on or is he gone? Okay, Liam asks a question. Designs useless architecture. How does this branch of architecture art design relate to systems and structure? Um, I need to do more research on that. Uh, Michael, you're asking, what is time? Do you want to clarify that a little bit? Um, but first, I mean, <laughs> But thanks for the presentation. I think uh, a lot of like a uh, theoretical uh, word, uh, uh, I'll say that. But uh, I think a little bit complicated, you know, I mean, uh, we, if we talk, uh, we, but first I think the, the presentation is really depends on the, you know, the structure. I think uh, we understand the scope is changing or is not changing. It's really, you know, the, the, the the interaction, did we change the scope or not? I mean, the time, because it's based on the time, but what was the time, you know, a lot of things we didn't really make clear. So how we can make the things in order in a structured way, right? And a lot of word, if you say it's not a material word, what I say is a material, we can touch, we can feel, it's really exists in the world. But the, the word we use, a lot of concept, that means the concept for you is one definition. For me, it's another definition. So is kind of like an invisible, invisible the world we talk to each other, get get the answer. I think it's, it's complicated the first. Secondly, the time we would really look at time outside. There's no time. Is everything is now, no, no, you know. Yeah. So if you if if you make the time like a foundation, you have older, that means uh, I mean, from like a logical point of view, special for the human being, for the human being, sorry, it, it doesn't work, you know. And another thing is the human being, the thinking way is kind of like scope. When I talk to you, you talk to me. So we, we also increase the scope of our thinking. It doesn't mean that the, the scope of the thinking is fixed. So okay. even that way, with all the inter interaction, the logic way, it really depends, it's, it's dynamic. Or it's, like a, it's, not, it's not like a computer, like zero one. You know? So the logic, it doesn't work. 
Yeah. So, so in time, there's two definitions that come from the Greek. One is chronos and one is kairos. Um, and so the, the question is whether, and uh, last time I was writing about this, um, when, you, when you talk about rhythm um, and you talk about music, uh, music swings, which is kairos, because it's, it's a feeling that you have. Um, so it feels fast, it feels slow. Um, that's not clock time per se. And so when we're actually dealing a lot with the, uh, the questions on, um, on time uh, and temporality, so we take temporality of the landscape as an example, uh, that's really an anthropological view. And then you're gonna get into the question, you know, does the tree fall in the forest if no one hears? Um, and, uh, and so if you're, if you're taking an anthropological perspective, then that definitely says you're looking at human beings and how they're looking at the world. So, so yes, there, there are issues with how you define time. Um, I agree with you uh, in the sense of there's only now, um, like there is no future, there is past uh, because we experienced it. Um, but that again is getting into, um, uh, into philosophical fine points about how you're using it. So one of the things that I would say is that um, philosophy I've always framed as a pursuit of better questions rather than a pursuit of better answers. And so one of the things about philosophies is using the, an appropriate philosophy at an appropriate time. Um, so some people may not find, uh, may not find this view of, of change and changelessness of uh, you know, what is real um, as useful. Uh, if you are dealing with um, living, living systems uh, where you've got uh, life that progresses over time, then time becomes important because if you're if you take time out of it, then in effect you're dead. Uh, 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 I think a human human being is a little bit tricky, you know. Uh, for we can I can take one like a small example, maybe make a it's more specific. Otherwise, you know, if we talk about the, like all the concept is hard to understand. I think for the human being, we understand the world is not by really we we can directly touch. It's by by our seeing. You know, we see the things, we hear the things, we touch things, whatever. So we have image in our brain. Right? But that brain the image is totally different from the re realities. So yeah. we can, so, so based on that, because that's the that's the that's the fact. That's the fact we couldn't, but we only have that tool can understand the outside the world. So that's the limitation we need to understand. And based on that, we create like a second layers. You know, we have the image, and we will see the image. Who see the me, image? It's still me. I create the image. I see my image. That's why we create a reference. So that we can feel like you say swim. You know, time is created. You know, but the. If you, yeah, I think that's the human being, how it's a function. And then based on that fact function, I think we go, go to the flow to, to otherwise it's, we, we take like a machine or like a rubber, the logic applied to the, apply to the human being. I, I feel it's kind of like a reverse the logic. You know? Yeah. Um, so uh, some of the work that's done, uh, Robert Rosen and, and in those cases, they reverse it and they in effect look at living beings as like there's two ways of approaching systems. One would be that you start from um, mechanisms and machines and you start building up towards living beings. The other way of doing it would say that you start from living beings and then you work your way down to the machines. And so in Robert Rosen's work you know, on, on anticipatory systems, that's what he does instead is he starts from the idea of, of living things and then a machine is a special case of something that's non-living. Um, but again, that's pretty philosophical. And uh, if, if we have an interest in the group, we could get uh, Judith Rosen in to speak about it again. She hasn't done it in a couple of years now. Should we move on to Tim? You put some stuff in the chat, Tim. Uh, yeah, that's so I don't have to talk. Uh -huh. Please. No, I'm just I'm kidding. I just just a couple of things that came to mind, just kind of scatter shot around some of the topics that were just discussed and stuff about what is philosophy. Those are some handy things that I like because they 
simplify it. You know, they they don't don't get too uh, high. You know, conceptual about trying to define philosophy because that's the problem with philosophy, right? It's tough to get your handle on like what is it. You know, what kind of an endeavor is it? Because mm -hmm. the all manner of ideas presented and they're all very different. And you talked about the two major categories earlier on with your two columns. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I like these ones just because they're kind of grounded. Uh, Deleuze has a book actually called What is Philosophy? And he basically comes down, he elaborates on it, but he basically just says it's just it's, it's when we create new concepts. So uh, and whether they're productive or not, that's an open question. Um, I think something that uh, is born out in time and such. So that's all I was adding there, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Don, do I have to unmute you to get off? Let's see, I do. Let me uh, ask to unmute. Let's see if that happens. There we go. There you Thank go. You. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just reading a couple of new books that came out. One of them is called The Courage to be Happy, and it was called The Courage to be Disliked, uh, written by Japanese writers. And they've done, apparently, the sales have been enormous in the, in the uh, Asian, in Asia. In Korea and uh, Japan, in particular, and probably not in mainland China, but um, I, I feel a certain resonance in some of the discussion here. Uh, I think it, I'm putting words in his mouth, of course, but he's it's been long dead. So um, Alfred Adler would have might have said that um, teleology really matters. It's the only thing we really have to work with. And he said, he would have said that a lot of our goals that we we do not understand very well, because we're trying to um, to preserve a certain image of what we think ourselves and reality is. Okay, and now this has a relationship to this, some of this discussion, and one of the reasons we never change, <laughs> you know, to any extent, is because we're we're running like like hell uh, just to stay in one spot because we're constantly adapting, we're forced to. But uh, our image is of um, a way of looking at the world uh, that we wish to preserve because it's what we know and change is painful and uncertain. And uh, that's just one aspect of it. But I thought it had a resonance here because I think it's what we do a lot of the time because we have this static view of ourselves to start with and then everything else. Akoff had a, um, a helpful distinction um, between types of attitudes towards change. Uh, so he, he had the, um, the reactive who liked the world the way it was and are always trying to go backwards. The inactive mm. who don't, who like the way that it is right now and don't want to do anything. Um, the preactive or proactive, which are usually uh, a lot of technologists are always proactive because I think the future is going better than a day. Mm. And then he prescribed uh, actually the interactive would be actually um, working in the present. Yes. Um, and so when you're doing planning, uh, one of the things that um, I'm always conscious of is when, when you're at a meeting, was there a decision actually made so that you're actually going to take action or are you just talking about something in the future that isn't going to happen? Mm -hmm. um, but, but the, the attitudes are, are interesting um, about um, when you're talking about change. Uh, so, you know, technologists as an example, um, you know, so always a new release of software, always new stuff coming. And it's kind of like, doesn't make a difference and it doesn't help. And, and, but they are very preactive, proactive. So I would say that not everyone is trying to uh, actually stabilize. I would say that technologists are tending to destabilize. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think a lot of people, when they, when they see the technology coming along, they think, oh, this is great. You know, this is the new, great new, new thing. But then uh, when it comes to actually dealing with it, they find that at a certain level, there's a, quite a resistance, which they can't really control or, don't, or haven't figured out how to control. Mm -hmm. Other people have comments? It's all free for all now. So raise your hand if you're interested in saying something. 
Hey, hi, do. Go ahead, Kelly. Okay, so I um my background has changed and it's not systems. And so I, I've been listening to this conversation interestingly. Um, Don, you, you, your comment that that uh, about people and change. I thought I I I, I think that I live for change, and I, and I don't think that, and I think that I'm looking for those markers in terms of just from my background. Um, what is the change, and how does that manifest itself? That was that was a large part of my professional background. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't know where that that leads me or. or I'm not, I'm not okay well uh, let me put it this way i'm looking at it from the conscious versus unconscious perspective and uh, a lot of people are very keen on change consciously but not so much uh, at other levels it creates problems for them it, it means constantly rethinking refeeling uh re-relating you know and um uh even if they in in principle want to see change and there are plenty of good reasons to see it um they might have to struggle oh, well i agree with you that 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 certainly most people don't like change and it certainly has a lot of um reaction towards keeping things existing of mm -hmm. what they know uh e even in academics we certainly know that there be people are keeping lots of systems in place because yep. it's self-serving for them uh, from a place of knowing as opposed to unknowing. Yes, I, I, I would I would say, to, in all fairness to people who do this, because a lot of people do, and we all do to some extent, um, it's threatening to their very identity. It's threatening to the very place they have in the world at a certain level, right? So they want to they slow it down at the very least or try to compress it so they understand it. In fact, that's basically what the human being does. And uh, that's what your brain does. It compresses input. If it, if it tried to understand all of the neurons firing away in, in, your, in your head at the same time or in a certain period of time, you would literally go nuts. You just couldn't handle it. Uh, so the brain is, is organized to compress, but it compresses to something that it finds comprehensible. So that is the normal the normal way we work as human beings, and, and our whole body co cooperates with that. By the way, it's not just the brain. Sure, so, and I mean, I think, we I have think to come over. We have to go past that if we're going to understand things differently. Is all I'm saying. So, so by the so way, it's different for everybody. By the way, go sorry, go ahead. Well, well, I think that in my past background in terms of providing design intelligence. That was the uh, uh, communication that we would need for people to um, be aware of the change and then to be able to understand it in terms of a way that they could eventually accept it. But mm -hmm. to, to negate that the change was happening, it's not that it was good or bad or that I wanted it. It simply was, here are uh, markers that uh, it, is, it is changing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. David, I'm just going to switch the topic because I also was interested in terms of, of the David Hawk and, and entropy, because I, I, I just mm -hmm. thought that, um, you know, looking at change and even from an environmental perspective, I wish that was it uh, Dean who was on the call and, um, you know, I, I, I would be interested in having that that conversation as well. But, you know, when we think about entropy in terms of, uh, let's say something something to dust to dust or, or whatever that is um, when something changes and it goes to dirt it has changed its form but it's not necessarily dead or en entropy at maximum entropy uh well so if, if it is equilibrium then it's at maximum entropy mm -hmm. um so so the the issue and this we should really get david hawk on a separate <laughs> separate call for this one this one's going to be deep yeah, um, no, I, I, I'll yeah. I'm, I look forward to that, that opportunity. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I, the definition is something that I don't know that I agree with. Well, uh, and, and, and so, um, so David Hawk was involved in what actually became Energy Star. And so he has a lot of experience that um, Dean is not aware of. Uh, but one of the questions comes out about recycling and the question about whether you're using more resources in the recycling 
than you are in actually just throwing it away and um, and and you know not re not recycling. And uh, that's in an most cases, point uh, yeah. as far as uh, uh, sustainability and recycling in terms of uh, uh, an action that keeps systems in place. Mm. We have some hands up, and so uh, Michael has a hand up, and Bruce has a hand up, and then Liam just put a comment in. So, Michael? I, I just want to share a small thing uh, with the, you know, which uh, other person, maybe it's very funny. Uh, if you look at like Western language, so uh, English, French, uh, Spanish, so we have the time, you know, it's kind of like a way. We we all do something in the future, you know. We 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 went some in the past, and then we we go we go in the moment. But if we look at Asia language, like Chinese, for example, they don't have time. They say we go somewhere in the future. We go somewhere in the past. We go somewhere now. You know, I think it's totally different. Like uh, you know, uh, uh, philosoph different uh, thinking. I think from Asia culture, they will think the past. Is a memory of the moment, and the future is the projection of the moment. So that's why they, they prefer to live in the moment. Uh, regarding to say like a change, go you know no change. I think both is come from the wisdom of of human beings. So Western culture, I think mostly we like a change. That's why we need a goal. We need a purpose. So we need a purpose. We need a goal. We need a time because the time creates the energy, potential energy, we, we need to re-push ourselves. And then we, we learn in our language, we need to put like, you know, the future past, we, we, we separate the later things and we, the later things that make, make human being to move forward. But in the Asian culture, I think their style is like no change. They live in the moment. So that's why in the language, they don't create like a layer for the time. And they, they pay for the moment. And uh, they they try to use another chain, another goal. They try to use the acceptance. So whatever happened, I try to accept that. So I accept that is is the power. So I, I can I can I can dealing with that. So I think both is works. It's come both come from like human being based on the location, based on the you know the situation, the culture, political, whatever. I, I don't see which one is better than another's. It really depends on the on the you know, situation. Sometimes we have the goal, but the goal eat us. We forget ourselves, we just sacrifice to the goal. And if, if we cannot make the goal, we cannot, we lost, you know, someone, they don't have purpose, even they cannot leave, you know, that's, that's another thing. But for the no training, maybe they have another thing, but you know, it's kind of like a riches of, I mean, the, the very rich, the, the, the power, very rich, the culture things, you know, that make the, make the whole human being more, more multi-dimension, you know, not like structure things. We we'll, we we'll always always think like a zero one, you know. It's really kind of like, uh, but that's my comments. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Bruce. Uh, thank you. Um, talking about change, one of the um, one of the fascinating things that I've been experiencing um, and trying to explain is how I actually do change. And um, one of the things I've realized is that, in a sense, I've always treated people and organizations as living systems. But I didn't have the vocabulary until I understood uh, Maturana and Varela and some of those people. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, if you think of a social system, a team in an organization, um, and you try and find out what the autopoetic uh, element is in that team that move, moves it far from equilibrium. One of the things is communication. And in fact, that's the only thing that seems to be the way that social systems actually move or change or build shared elements or something like that. So it's quite fascinating the importance of communications and symbol systems and meaning in terms of the communication. And um, part of change is when people feel that, uh, for example, there's power over and then power to, power with. Um, I've always found that 
being able to get the best change is when things are co-created. People are doing collective thinking together and building something new rather than something that people have vested interests and in, that kind of thing. I just thought I'd share that and how important it is to see the living aspects of organizations. And I guess the final comment is when I talk to the, a lot of the people building technology, I say, why are you calling, calling these things actors? And you're conflating machines with people and organizations. People are very different types of systems and machines. So I say, you have to call people, people in any of the modeling that they're doing in terms of architecture, because they're very different characteristics of systems. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about machines and their characteristics. And the, the way they relate is very different because of the living system nature and the probabilistic effects. When I read on purposeful systems, it's all about probability when you talk about uh, a lot of the things that happen not uh, deterministic in terms of what ACOF says. So it's very, um, it's been enlightening to see that a lot of my approach to management and change has been thinking of who and what we're doing with living systems and seeing the interactions and creating the aliveness in the organization. It's really quite powerful, but that goes back to being and becoming because Collectively, you create something new. And that's the kind of becoming, which is part of change, which is really quite, quite fun. That's, that's what I enjoy doing. Okay. Enough of that. Take too much time. Thanks, Thank Bruce. you. Uh, Liam. Hi, I, I'm not sure I uh, have as much to contribute. I am just, my mind is sort of melting over here listening to everyone uh, and all the contributions. And I'm just sort of putting pings out into the universe to see if they hit any satellites that maybe bounce back. I, I uh, you know, as, as Kelly was talking, I was just thinking of a metaphor that, um, that I've used when people have asked about my firm. And I just, you know, this idea of the forest fire when um, if you have all this essentially, you may, you might be, you may describe it as dead or a uh, sort of organic material that then, uh, you know, it is, it is a tree, but then it, you know, through this process, it becomes uh, different types of material. I guess you could say it's alive and that it, it might have elements like earth, you know, soil, is it alive? You know, so this is idea, I think it is. And so it's, it was like this notion of, um, sort of drawing on maybe aspects of what I understand from Asimov or whatever, it, it like basically, or others have talked about this, I'm not, anyway, you know, like fragments and, and small pieces, and then they all sort of collect and into, uh, as I described in that comment, a matrix from which uh, if it's a jack pine tree, for example, the pine cone uh, is heated by the fire and it, it, the seed bursts open and all of this matter that has collected on the, the floor of the forest uh, becomes this, this place where new life can come from. And so it's this notion of, you know, every contribution might, might be valuable, any two points, you know, I guess it's a notion of a-centered multiplicities, rhizomatic thinking, like any two points might connect and, uh, and can you do that isolated or with a group? And, and, and when should you bring in different aspects because they might have different benefits or reasons for operating in different modes. And I guess earlier I mentioned, I, I was out for a walk and my phone died. And, friend of mine is doing his PhD and he's discussing um, useless architecture. And I was reflecting on some of the comments about systems having a goal, you know, and like, if you would think about like a building or a structure, it should have some goal, you know, and I love this notion of useless architecture because it, it, at least in the, it's sort of, I'm not saying that you were saying that it should have a goal. I know you were saying it shouldn't, or at least to, to have a thought bubble or, you know, pocket of your mind where you could, think about systems as not having a goal. Uh, and so in that world, I was just thinking about, you know, useless architecture and like, I don't know, say a, a staircase that goes to nowhere and doesn't have a particular view of any special landmark, say, you know, uh, it's like broken, but it, 
but it's still a system. It's still a process. I don't know how to describe it. Anyway, I'll stop there. No, that's that's helpful. So, so on the useless architecture, it's um, that that is interesting because the use depends. Like, so when you're actually working with function, you would have to create the whole in which it has use. And so it may be useless to someone, but to someone else, you know, maybe in, needs inspiration. Uh, it could be useful. Um, and on the uh, on the uh, jack pines and the fire, um, I, I presume you haven't covered panarchy theory yet. <laughs> uh, so so yes, you'll you'll get into that. Um, panarchy is actually the one that when when I'm teaching, I actually say, you think you've got it, and then ten years later you go, oh, now I know what they meant. Uh, because there's succession that happens. And so mm -hmm. there's a, um, a, um, a life and death cycle. But what happens is that you're in an ecology. And so when you're defining the whole, it's not just the tree, it is the whole forest. And the, there is the idea of memory, which is uh, what the slower, slower layers remember. And then the first things that grow are not trees, they're usually shrub and bushes. And so then you have the fast moving things going on. So, yeah, so you have to ask Peter or Jeremy to about panarchy theory if you're gonna cover it. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other people who want to speak? Michael and Bruce have their hands up, but uh, I think they were up from before. Yeah, I can have a comment. I was just thinking about uh, change, the discomfort of change. Um, but you know, there's also rate of change, unless you consider all of reality to be a consistent rate of change. Uh, but then I was thinking about how process philosophy relates to pan computationalism. Um, you know, this idea there's a finite step in time forward and that change has to happen no matter what, you know, um, and then the uh, idea of change uh, over time and space, um, right, and the change towards your ideal makes you more comfortable, change away from your ideal makes you less comfortable, so is change happening to you? Or are you causing that change? Or are you just creating that illusion for yourself, right? So if one culture attempts to you know, convert or change other cultures to something more similar, it's causing change to those other cultures, but it's reducing the difference to its own culture. So it's actually from the, you know, a self-perspective mm -hmm. reducing change. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I was just, just thinking you know, that aspect of it uh, you know, change in the propagation of information over time and of, you know, space. And then the fact that, you know, James Webb telescope just, you know, launched and it's going to show us pictures 13 billion years old, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but that, 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 that change has all happened, but change takes a long time, you know, to even reach our understanding that it has happened. So th there's a, this is a very interesting lens at looking, you know, at everything in the uh, I don't know, it's not often you get to look at everything in a fresh new way, but I'm going to attempt to do so. And, you know, I, I will do it wrong until I do it right. <laughs> there, there's so some interesting so. questions about, about change and systems change. And what does it really mean to system or systemic change as in your graduate where they're teaching systemic design? Uh, you know, so how many people actually do design, how many people do systemic design? Um, and, and I think that's been part of the issue is that a lot of people who have been talking about systems change actually just mean change. They don't mean systems change. Um, but the, the, the way I think about it, if you, if you think about um, the, the pacing layers approach, um, change within the layer um, that's natural, that's you know, moving furniture around is not such a big deal. When you start tearing out walls, all of a sudden people start getting uncomfortable. Um, Yeah, and at the same time, you know, uh, the, I'm on the shore of Lake Superior, there are rocks here that are 2.7 billion years old, mm -hmm. right? So, but they still undergo, you know, a, a, a sort of a change, but, you know, so that way you can, you know, view, you know, a given volume of space as a change density, you know, over a given, you know, spatial temporal period. Thanks, Petri. Uh, Tim had put in something. Uh, kind of speaks for itself, just really, as said, it, it, 
Atlanta's not here. If she was here, I know she just seeing the words system and purpose in the same sentence, she would just offer this one perhaps. Yeah, the purpose of a system of what it what it does is actually an interesting statement because that's kind of almost anti teleological, which, you know, if the system was built for a goal, but that's not what it's actually doing, then it's like, is that still teleology? So it's an interesting question there. It's kind of like a, you could call it like the process uh, dual of that other fellow, you'll remember his name with the uh, system critique, the fellow who does the boundary critique, you know? Uh, Yes, it's almost um, the process dual of, of that fellow's uh, uh, boundary critique, which is was more structural. Hmm. I see that Don raised his finger, and so I'm going to unmute him. There you go. There you go. Yeah, <clears throat> it's. Uh, I think we don't understand very much what we intend often, and um, we don't understand that our entire being is, is totally enmeshed in our environment, which has a lot to do with it, including the social environment, which is a really big deal. And um, therefore, teleology, can, I believe, can certainly exist, though we may not understand it very well because we're, we're concentrating, focusing on certain elements that we think are going to make for a more perfect, you know, whereas we should be working on the relationships uh, and on the the appropriate adaptations, in which case we could find some happiness, we could find some satisfaction, but it requires a certain amount of hum humility as well, which often doesn't come easy. That's as far as I'd like to go with that and without going into hours of discussion. <laughs> Thanks. And Tim responded again with uh, Werner Alwick. Yes, on boundary critique. So. Okay, so last call. Um, had a good discussion. Uh, does anyone want to make some uh, parting comments? I'll just say that um, one of the things that was the very first thing you read about with Whitehead was his uh, what he called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Mm -hmm. Right, and just like this, uh, what uh, Alana's you know repping Stafford Beer's purpose of system is what it does, or Ehrlich's boundary critique. These are invitations to not just see things kind of in a accepted, not, to, not, not kind of just salute the accepted wisdom, so to speak, but to challenge things a little bit. And I think Whitehead from a process philosopher standpoint, when he yeah. said, talked about the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, he was again, similarly just trying to say, hey, like, you know, realize that when you look around and you think things are concrete objects or things in the world, um, appreciate that they are themselves processes of you know reality unfolding and becoming you know don't mm -hmm. don't 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 let that uh seizing upon what appears to be concreteness limit your thinking opportunities so i thought that was powerful enough like that that's a, yeah. that that's that's good enough payback for a uh, look at process philosophy right there as far as i'm concerned you know um, yeah. Yeah. Kelly, you're muted. I just want to launch this this question. Um, years ago, when we were, we were talking and forecasting um, about going into a digital age and uh, the collapse of time and space, and how this uh, that that statement uh, might relate to what we are talking about in terms of process. Um, so when, when that's, uh, that's difficult because when, uh, so that would be more of a structural view because you're talking about two points in time, uh, process would be much more about the space between them, I think. Um, and so when you're doing trends, that's process because you're actually not looking at the end point, you're kind of looking at the line between now and then does that help but, but i no? mean you, you i mean you're looking at trends that are happening but but it's it's about explaining change and when we're speaking about uh developing a new process uh 
over time and space. I, I mean, I, I don't know that I, that I have a conclusion or a statement. I, I think that it's an interesting comment and thought in particular to this dialogue. I guess, I guess there's a question as to whether you think you can influence or not influence um, the change that happens. Mm -hmm. Kelly talked about digital uh, or something like that, like and then collapse of space and time. So if, if it has to do with, you know, grappling with complexity of uh, change you know my, my reference to digital was as we went into the digital age there was a yeah. collapse of time and space okay so i would just say like one thing that comes to mind is that process ideas could be a tool in the toolkit to un dis, to, to, to dislodge and sort of unlock static concrete uh categorization and sort of uh fixed static ontologies so to speak of like well people are here and it takes that much time to get there and a person can only be in one place at one time and a person can only have one identity or undertake one action at a time well in a world where i can have like 15 deep fakes of myself auto automated as bots in 10 different channels all at the same time executing strategies that i ultimately generated uh this is not the case so so in as much as like process and more fluid kind of thinking can can you know then someone mentioned earlier that that freeze unfreeze thing unfreeze freeze thing right so maybe process thinking can be part of the content or it can be a place to look to for ideas and creative inspiration around what happens when you unfreeze some of the categories that that are somewhat challenged or broken by the new possibilities of a increasingly complex and digit digital and what have you kind of uh, world down you know, in the future. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's a rich kind of reservoir of ideas, I think, process thinking and process ideas for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I think that uh, we've covered the topic. We're going to need more expertise on this if we have to go further. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I and a couple of people have read Whitehead that's uh, further ahead than me. Actually, that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'll welcome everyone for next month. Um, we're working on a um, working on another topic. Um, I'm going to leave it as a mystery for now, but I should announce it pretty soon. So, um, keep in touch, and um, and we'll see you next month. All right. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Hmm.